Hi, I'm Hopi Hoekstra. I'm a faculty member at Harvard University. I'm a member of two departments, the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Department and the Molecular and Cellular Biology Department. I'm an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and curator of mammals at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Science these days is very interdisciplinary so I don't even know what to call myself, whether it's an evolutionary biologist or a geneticist or a developmental biologist. Science has taken me into the lab doing sort of molecular biology and genetics, but it's also taken me out into the field where I've been able to explore um, animals and their natural environments, which I think is a key in the process of understanding how they adapt to different environments. So I've done field work in the Kuril Islands um, off, off the uh, east coast of Russia, um, I've studied rodents in uh, South America for my dissertation, and then I've studied um, the current organism I work on, deer mice, all over North America. I think there are a lot of scientists who knew they were going to be scientists from a very young age. I feel like I was a little bit of a late bloomer. So I went to University of California, Berkeley uh, with an intent uh, to be a political scientist. Uh, my dream job was to be the ambassador to Holland because my family is uh, Dutch and I saw that as a way to connect uh, my Dutch heritage with my with a job. And when I started taking classes, I was less interested than I thought I would be. I realized that I thought I might want to try biology, so I signed up for an advanced physiology course with permission from the faculty member and he sort of warned me and said, you have to um, do really well in this course because I'm letting you in even though you don't have the prerequisites and that was the little fire um, that I needed to really study hard and I fell in love with biology right from the beginning. I remember working really hard and I got the highest grade in the class and I think that was the start of my biology career because the professor then asked me to join if I wanted to join his lab and do real research and it was my first chance to sort of understand you know, the research process, which I immediately fell in love with. As I've gotten sort of older or more experienced in the field, I think there's another component that I find really important, and that is training the next generation of scientists. So I take a lot of pleasure from the successes of um, students and postdocs and undergraduate students and even high school students that come and visit our lab. Um, seeing them discover the scientific process, build their confidence and become um, sort of the next generation of scientists has really been satisfying. I always giggle a bit when somebody um, compliments me on being a uh, sort of a scientific communicator um, because I wish they could see me back when I was an undergraduate at college where I was absolutely petrified of public speaking. So I think one of the, the lessons I'd like to share is that um, you know scientific communication for some people maybe comes naturally. For a lot of people, it takes a lot of um, practice. Um, it's something that we do in my lab um, a lot. Whenever anybody gives a presentation at a scientific meeting um, or in sort of any sort of venue is we practice. Um, and this is something that I really um, try to instill in, um, in my trainees is that ability to give us, you know, to talk science to anybody. What's so nice about it is that there's a big reward um, when you really feel like you connect um, with an audience. So today what I wanna do is tell you about nature's palette uh, and talk about the biological significance of color. So all this wonderful color and color patterns that have evolved um, over evolutionary time. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by telling you a little anecdote to put this uh, talk in a larger context. Then I'm gonna tell you about some of the research we've been doing to understand color, both how and why it varies. And then towards the end of the talk, we'll broaden out to talk about other organisms from uh, lizards to dogs uh, to humans and talk a moment about um, coloration there. Okay, so. As Alejandro mentioned, uh, I'm trained as an evolutionary geneticist. And what I find remarkable about uh, this is that um, I still am in awe about all that Darwin got right even uh, 200 years ago. And um, his most famous book, of course, is called On the Origin of Species, which he outlined the idea of evolution by natural selection. 
And so what I find uh, so special about this idea is not only how profound it was, but also how simple and elegant it is. So in this book, he put forth the relatively simple idea that if you have a population of organisms and they compete for resources, but resources are limited such that not everybody can survive to reproduce, and that there is variation among individuals in their ability to compete. And three, if that variation is heritable, that is passed on from generation to generation, then that population should, be, should evolve over time to be more fit to the environment in which it's found. Now, in the origin of species, through careful experimentation and observation, Darwin lays out much evidence for competition among individuals and variation in their competitive abilities. But there was one missing piece in his theory, and that was the piece of heritability. Now he recognized that traits were heritable just by observing the re resemblance of offspring to their parents. But what he didn't know was the mechanism, how traits were inherited. Now, of course, in Darwin's time, this was unknowable. So what I wanna do to start off with is just tell you a quick anecdote that links Darwin um, to that second great discovery that is of the three-dimensional structure of DNA. So what you're looking at here, I don't expect you to read, but maybe you can just sit and look in awe because this is Darwin's last publication. It was published uh, just three weeks before he died in 1882. And it's published in a journal called Nature, which is um, arguably one of the prom most prominent uh, scientific journals today as it was then. The title of this um, article is called On the Dispersal of Freshwater Bivalves. And really what it is is a natural history observation of a little cockle or freshwater clam that was clamped to the leg of a water beetle. Why was this published in Nature even back in 1882? Well, it ended up solving this great mystery about how these freshwater clams could move from lake to lake in the British Midlands. Okay, but that's a little bit besides the point. What's more relevant to today's story is how Darwin got his hands on this specimen, this freshwater beetle with the cockle on its leg. Well, it was sent to him by a British shoemaker by trade who enjoyed natural history. He sent the specimen to Darwin and they had a flurry of correspondence. Well, it turns out this young shoemaker's name was Walter Drawbridge Crick. And to some of you, that name might ring a bell because it was that young shoemaker's grandson with his colleague, Jim Watson, and of course, important uh, critical insights by Rosalind Franklin that led to that discovery of the missing mechanism in Darwin's theory that is how DNA replicates and carries genetic information from one generation to the next. What Watson referred to quite humbly as the secret of life. And it's really in this DNA code that we find even more evidence for Darwin's great theory, our three billion year existence, the shared evolutionary uh, history of all living creatures. And one other thing that I wanna to talk to about tonight and that is how changes in this code give rise to the variation that we see both within and between species. So like Darwin, we were really interested in how this diversity arose, but thanks to Watson, Crick, and Franklin, we're able to look for at least some of those answers in our DNA. So today what I wanna do is focus on two big questions, and that is, both why and how traits vary in nature. So what I'd like to do is tell you a three-part story that involve the connections between traits and their environment and traits and their genes. In other words, and with a particular focus, I should say, on coloration being our trait of interest. And in particular, we wanna know why color varies and how that color variation may be linked to the environment in which organisms find themselves. And we wanna know how color varies. That is, what are the genetic changes that give rise to variation in color? And it's really when we understand these how and why questions that we have a much bigger um, and more complete appreciation for the biological significance and evolutionary significance of color. Okay. So why do we study color at all? 
Well, color became of interest to me in my lab in part because color is one of the most variable traits um, in organisms. We see variation both within and between species. It's also one of the primary ways in which um, organisms interact with their environment. And we know it's involved in a number of biological processes. Alejandro mentioned a few already. So for example, color can be really important in reproduction. So just think of the canonical example of the male peacock's tail as he sort of waves that in front of the pe uh, female peacock, encouraging her to mate. And the bot botanical equivalent of that uh, may be thought of as a petal, where the bright, beautiful petal colors uh, lure in particular pollinators, which then carry pollinators to other flowers. But just as color can be used to attract individuals, it can also be used to repel individuals. And one good example of that is warning coloration. So here, um, what you see is this beautifully colored orange, brightly colored orange uh, poison arrow frog. And this frog is brightly colored um, to warn its predators of its high levels of toxicity that it's found in its skin. Now, no good biological story is complete without some cheaters. So we have those individuals that mimic uh, those uh, species that are toxic. So they get the benefit of deterring predators without the cost of producing the toxins themselves. And then finally, we have an example um, shown here of this little frog um, that's cryptically colored, blending into its environment, potentially hiding from predators. Now, as I told you, these explanations for why color varies, these all seem to make sense um, and are very good explanations, some of which have been shown, but sometimes um, we're wrong about the use of uh, color. And one example that we've recently learned more about is why zebras have stripes. The question of why zebras have stripes has been long debated. Um, one of the most vigorous uh, uh, participants in those debates was Teddy Roosevelt, uh, our former president. Uh, who argued quite uh, vociferously that zebra stripes um, were a form of camouflage as the zebra moves through the dense thickets in the savannas in Africa. Well, that may be true, but recent studies have shown that stripes also serve another purpose, and that is they serve to reduce parasite load. So in a series of incredibly clever experiments, which involve things like putting zebra um, colored jackets on the top of horses, uh, researchers have been able to show that having a striped pattern reduces the number of parasitic tsetse flies that land on uh, zebras relative to solid color, for example, horses, thus reducing their parasite load. Another recent twist has come in studies of chameleons. We were all taught as uh, when we were younger that chameleons change their colors to match in with their local environments, but it turns out color probably is more of an indicator of physiological condition of that individual rather than used as camouflage. So the reason that we study color is in part because of this connection with an individual or a species ecologies. And we know in many of these cases that even small changes in color or pattern can have dramatic effects on an organism's ability to survive and reproduce or their fitness. The other reason we study color is because we can take advantage of nearly a century's worth of work by geneticists studying primarily laboratory mice who have been able to identify genes that affect pigmentation. So again, I don't expect you to read this list of genes, but just appreciate that we know of over 200 genes that when you mutate that gene, it can have an effect on color. And most of these studies have come, come about when a researcher has a laboratory population, let's say of black mice, and all of a sudden a white mouse pops up um, in that colony as a spontaneous uh, mutant. And then we can use genetics to figure out what those genes are. So both because it's ecologically relevant and we have some handle on the genetics, this makes it a prime uh, trait to study to try to understand how evolution drives changes in this particular trait. So to study this uh, question, we've been focusing, as Alejandro mentioned, on my favorite organism that is deer mice in the genus Paramiscus. And of the 55 species, this is arguably my favorite one. It's called Paramiscus polyanotis, but is often just referred to as the old field mouse. And it's called the old field mouse because throughout its range in uh, the southeastern US, so Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Northern Florida, 
Um, the mice typically, um, they, they occupy these overgrown agricultural fields, um, which were called old fields. And in those habitats that have pretty dense cover and dark loamy soils, the mice typically look like this. That is, they have a dark brown coat, a strongly striped tail, and a light colored grayish belly. But these mice are also of interest to us because they have recently colonized these beach habitats and sand uh, bar islands off the Gulf Coast of Florida, as well as the Atlantic Coast of Florida. And when they live on these uh, sand dune habitats, they're referred to as beach mice. And each one of these numbers represents a different subspecies of uh, this larger species complex. So I'm gonna to start today by talking about one of these populations that's highlighted here as number three. These are the Santa Rosa Island beach mice. And when we go out to study these beach mice, I have to admit it's one of the most beautiful field sites I've ever worked at. Uh, we usually like to go visit uh, Florida and these uh, sand dune islands, usually around February when it's miserable in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So here's a picture of one of our field sites here. I think I've caught my graduate student um, taking a little break on the beach, uh, but nonetheless, um, these sand dune islands are like, the way I describe it is like walking on hills of granulated sugar. They're absolutely beautiful. So compared to the mainland habitat, you can already see there's two differences. First, the color of the substrate is really different. So these islands are um, almost completely white, uh, the sand compared to the dark loamy soils of mainland habitat. And second, um, there's much less vegetative cover. So we think the mice here experience high levels of predation um, in their habitat and more about the predators in a moment. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we know something about the geological history of these islands. They're thought to be about um, four to 6,000 years old. And as these mice colonize these islands, it may not be surprising that they've evolved a different color pattern. So the first thing I wanna note is that um, these images are not to scale. Um, so this is not a giant um, beach mouse, but instead the two, uh, the mainland mouse and the beach mouse are the same size. They're about the size of a ping pong ball. So about 10 grams, they're very small. But you can see just from this image that the beach mice have reduced pigmentation on their face on their flanks or sides. And if you could see the tail, it's missing that um, strong stripe as well. And because the islands are fairly young, we think that this difference in color probably evolved in just a few thousand years. Okay, so you, what you're probably thinking is, well, that makes perfect sense, right? Being a light colored mouse, living on light colored soil, that mouse probably has an advantage um, because it's camouflaged in its habitat and therefore is less likely to get eaten by a visually hunting predator. Well, that's a good hypothesis. And we wanna be careful not to be accused of just making up a story that makes sense in the spirit of um, the stories that Ru Rudyard Kipling uh, wrote and then published in 1902, stories like how the camel got his hump or the le leopard its um, stripes. We don't wanna just make up a story about how the mouse got its color, but as a scientist, what I wanna do is design an experiment um, to test that hypothesis. So in other words, I want an experiment that can tell me or provide some insight into why um, these mice are light in color. And as I mentioned, we have this great hypothesis. So what's the experiment we can do? Well, if I could make up any experiment in the world, one of the things I'd love to do would be to take 100 light mice and 100 dark mice and release them in dark habitat, and then take equal frequencies and release them in light habitat, let them live out in the wild for a few months and then come back to see who survived. And the expectation would be that dark mice maybe survive better in dark habitat and light mice in light habitat. Okay, for a variety of reasons, that's a very hard experiment to do and the state of Florida wasn't in favor. So instead what we did was um, another experiment, which I call, used to call the next best experiment, but in some ways actually this experiment is better. And that is instead of um, releasing live mice, we re released models of mice. So here's my postdoc, Sasha Vigneri, and she, along with uh, Harvard undergraduate uh, Joanna Larson, uh, released, made and released hundreds of models of mice. Now, one of the nice in, in dark and light habitat and did the experiment that I just described. Now, one of the um, benefits of this experiment is that there's no difference in the light and dark mice besides their color. They're the same size, they look the same, they smell the same, etc. The downside of this experiment is that 
is the question of could we fool the predators? In other words, the mice didn't quite look, you know, they didn't move, they didn't smell, um, they didn't act quite like live mice. Well, I wouldn't be telling you about this experiment if it didn't work, so let me show you um, some evidence. So here what you're looking at, I hope you can see, is a mouse that's been attacked in this case by an avian predator. So it's missing a chunk out of its back as well as its left ear. This happens to be a dark mouse uh, that's been placed on light soil. So as we go out in the field, we can release, um, release equal numbers of dark and light mice in these habitats and then count up the number of predation events. So let me show you the um, simplified results of that experiment. So we could compare attack rates on mice that were cryptic, that is they match their background with those on the bottom that are non-cryptic and count up the number of attacks. And what you can see is that within a habitat, the mice that mismatch their backgrounds had a significantly higher attack rate compared to those that match their habitat. So that was the first result. Um, and this was in the direction we expected, right? There was a difference and it was the non-matched mice that were getting eaten more. The second thing to notice is that the attack rates are symmetrical. That is, it's just as bad to be a light mouse on dark habitat as it is, as it is to be a dark mouse on light habitat. The third thing we could do was to ask who's doing the attacking. And just by looking at sort of the evidence around each attack site, we could attribute them either to avian predators, which made up about half the attacks. So these are owls, herons, and hawks primarily. And the other half were mostly mammalian carnivores like coyotes and foxes. It turns out that this difference in um, survival of these clay models um, was quite strong. In other words, you had a, about a 50% increase in survival rate if you matched your substrate. So this experiment nicely provided some evidence about why color might vary and, and uh, um, also showed a role for natural selection in driving that variation. So the next question we wanted to ask was how these traits varied. What are the underlying genetics? So I'm not gonna spend much time or any time at all really telling you about how we got to this result, other than to say we were able to bring mice into the lab, do a series of genetic crosses, and one of the genes that we found that was implicated in an association between genetic variation and color variation was this gene called the melanocortin-1 receptor, or MC1R for short. Okay, so MC1R, I'm just gonna provide a, a quick details for those of you who are more molecularly oriented. Um, if you're not, well, uh, this will go quickly. Um, so this is a G protein coupled receptor. It's found in the membrane of pigment producing cells. And there are these nice seven transmembrane domains. This represents outside the cell and this represents inside the cell. The main job of this receptor is to take signals from outside the cell and send it inside. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the role of the melanocortin-1 receptor. Oh, um, but first, let me tell you, when we looked at um, the receptor and sequenced it both in the dark mainland and the light um, beach mice, the receptors looked absolutely identical in their DNA sequence, except for one base. So this is about a thousand base pairs long, totally conserved. One base was different, and that caused a change in the amino acid, which are represented by these little circles. Whereas most mammals and most mice have an arginine at position 65, our beach mice had a cysteine at that change. Now, all the beach mice had a cysteine, all the dark mice had an arginine. This is a beautiful, um, strong statistical correlation, but we wanted to understand not just if it's a correlation, but if it caused a change. So to do that experiment, next let me um, tell you a little bit more about what the melanocortin-1 receptor does. Okay, so what you're looking at here is this cartoon version of a pigment cell, uh, otherwise known as a melanocyte. In mammals, we produce two types of pigment, either dark eumelanin or light pheomelanin. And a pigment cell can produce one or the other and switch between the two. Now, eumelanin is responsible for hair color that's sort of brown to black, whereas pheomelanin is more responsible for blonde to red hair. And the difference between blonde and red hair is simply the amount of pigment that's deposited in that hair as it grows. 
So here I invite you, if, you're, if you so wish, to pluck one of your hairs, have a look at it, and you can determine whether you have eumelanin in your hair or pheomelanin in your hair. Now I imagine that some of you might pluck a hair and say, I have neither. I might have used to have eumelanin or pheomelanin, but now my hairs look like they have very little, if any, pigment. So let me just spend a second and say that indeed with age, um, the stem cell population that gives rise to these pigment cells starts to get depleted. So when you're producing less pigment cells, over time you end up not being able to produce as much pigment. And therefore you end up with hairs that are either unpigmented or have much less pigment um, than they had earlier in your life. Okay, so with that out of the way, let me just also say that humans relative to most mammals are quite boring in terms of their hair pigmentation. Our hairs tend to be uniformly colored, so they're just as blonde or brown at the tip as they are at the base. But most mammals have much more interesting hair colors. For example, mice or grizzly bears or deer or many mammals have this typical banding pattern, where as the hair grows, you get eumelanin at the tip, then it switches to pheomelanin and then switches back to eumelanin. So you get this wonderful banding pattern. And you can get all sorts of diversity in uh, overall color by changing, for example, the size of that pheomelanin band or adding additional bands. So here's where I encourage you, if you have a cat or a dog at home, maybe don't pluck a hair, but you know, look gently at one of their hairs. And many of our um, pets have incredibly interesting uh, banding pattern um, on their hairs certainly much more interesting than what we see in humans. Okay, so what about MC1R and what role does it play in the production um, of pigment? Well, you can think of MC1R as a sort of molecular switch. It tells that pigment cell whether to produce eumelanin or to produce pheomelanin. All pigment cells are able to produce both, but they only do one at a time. So when MC1R interacts with, let's say, um, an activator, that activator will bind to MC1R. And remember, its job is to signal inside the cell, and it does so by increasing a signaling molecule called cyclic AMP, and then you start producing dark pigment. If that activator goes away, or let's say you have a, a, a lesion or a mutation in that receptor, what can happen is the intracellular levels of cyclic AMP go down, and you produce pheomelanin. So MC1R is really the determinant that tells a cell what pigment to produce. Now let's think about how a mutation in MC1R might then lead to the difference in beach mouse color. Our hypothesis was that that mutation in beach mice actually lowers the receptor activity and results in the production, the switch from eumelanin to this lighter color pheomelanin, giving rise to the light coloration of beach mice. So we wanted to test this, and let me just show you one quick result um, from a cell-based assay that we did in the lab. So what we can do is take cells in a, in a laboratory culture and essentially generate these two receptors that remember differ by one nucleotide and one amino acid. And in that cell culture with the receptor, this is our, our dark mainland mouse receptor, we add increasing amounts of activator along the horizontal axis and measure the activity of the receptor by measuring M, uh, cyclic AMP. And what you can see is the more activator, the more activity you get. This is typical of most um, receptors. But if you make one base pair change to that receptor, like you do in beach mice, what you can see is that no matter how much activator you um, add, you never get up to activity levels, as you see in the mainland mice. In other words, this provides very nice evidence that this one DNA base pair change is, uh, contributes to the difference in coloration between these two mice. So now we know something about why um, these mice may be different colors and the role of natural selection. And now I told you something about how they might vary. And one of the main contributors is a single mutation in the melanocortin-1 receptor. So now we have a much more complete picture of, um, of uh, the sort of biological significance of color in this system. So next what I wanna do is take a step out from this one beach mouse population and talk a little bit about other populations. So just by way of reminder, as I mentioned, the Gulf Coast has 
five subspecies of beach mice and the Atlantic coast has uh, another three subspecies of beach mice. So we were really curious about these other subspecies and what they look like. Um, so what they look like and um, what their melanocortin one receptor looked like. So to do that, that meant we got to go back into the field again in February and catch a bunch of mice on these beautiful sand dune islands. So this is me with my um, postdoc, Vera Dominguez. Um, we've just captured a mouse. I'm weighing it um, with a pesola, as you can see in this image. And uh, Vera is taking measurements of different um, patterning elements on the body of that mouse. The one last thing we do with the mouse is that we take a little snippet of its tail so it donates a little DNA to our study. And the best part of this is that we then get to release the mouse back into the wild. So here's what um, a mouse looks like in its native habitat. And you can see this was one of our uh, organisms we cut because we gave it a little ear clip so we can monitor its survival over time. So we got to visit all of these islands um, in Florida, catch a bunch of mice, take some DNA samples. And here's what we found. So this is cartoon images just to give you a sense of the color variation. So the first thing you'll notice is that all of the beach mice are much lighter in color than the mainland mouse, which is shown in the bottom corner. The second thing you might notice is the beach mice look different from each other. So in fact, there's a lot of variation among these beach mouse subspecies. So much, but it varies in a really interesting way. So if I told you I went for spring break down to Florida and I stumbled across the beach mouse, if I told you I went to the Gulf Coast and you gave me, an, and I looked at that mouse, I could tell you with about 95% certainty what subspecies it was because these subspecies vary, vary consistently across populations. That is, there's very little variation within a population, but they can, you can see even from these images that there are differences in their color pattern. But if we did the same experiment and I said I went to Florida and I didn't tell you if I went to the Atlantic or the Gulf Coast, I would say I'd have a 50-50 chance of getting the right subspecies. And that's because these two subspecies uh, highlighted in green are almost indistinguishable. And these two subspecies are almost indistinguishable as are these two subspecies. So in other words, mice on the Gulf Coast are, are at least based on their color pattern are almost indistinguishable from those on the Atlantic coast. So this raises then the tantalizing question of are they indistinguishable in part because they share the same mutation in the melanocortin one receptor. So we sequence the melanocortin one receptor on our Atlantic coast mice asking does, do we see this arginine to cysteine change? And in fact, none of the Atlantic coast mice had that change. And there were no new mutations in the melanocortin one receptor that gave rise to a change in the, let's say the um, structure or function of the receptor that caused the same uh, effect on activity of the receptor. In other words, these two remarkably similar color patterns evolved not only through different mutations, but through different genes. So what that suggests is that why they varied might be the same reason, cryptically colored to avoid predation, but how they varied seemed to be different on Florida's Atlantic and Gulf Coast. In other words, there were different genetic solutions to this common ecological problem of wanting to be a light mouse on light soil. So let me end um, by telling you a few stories about how sometimes, so here we have a single species in which there are different solutions. Next, I wanna tell you a few stories about how very different species use similar solution, genetic solutions. Okay, so if you think about mice as a mammal, and you think about what's the most different in terms of their body morphology than a mouse. So if we were in the audience, people would shout out, usually I get answers like a whale, which I think is a really good answer. The second most common answer I get is the one I'm sort of looking for, which is elephant. But I don't really, I'm not gonna tell you about elephants, but instead I'm gonna tell you about something that's elephant-like, which I wouldn't expect you to guess, but that would be a mammoth. So turns out mammoths um, were a prime study organism for folks who were really interested in sequencing uh, ancient DNA. That is DNA found or extracted from uh, species that are no longer living on earth. And mammoths were such a great model in part because 
uh, remnants of mammals were often found in the permafrost in northern Russia. In other words, their DNA was essentially kept in a giant freezer for the last 14,000 years. So their DNA was really high quality. So when mammoths were first sort of uncovered and folks decided to sequence um, some of their genes, they thought about, well, our goal is to sequence a whole gene. What gene, what gene should we pick in the genome? And it turns out that researchers chose uh, the melanocortin-1 receptor. And they did that for two reasons. The first one being it's a short um, stretch of DNA. It's only a thousand base pairs long. It was just contiguous sequence. And second, um, it, had a, it had the potential to have an effect on color. So colleagues, I was sitting at a meeting and I sat next to somebody who was working on this and they said, oh, we found a mutation in the melanocortin-1 receptor in a population of three mammoths. There was a mutation. And I said, oh, that's interesting. We've been working on melanocortin-1 in our beach mice and we found a, mu a mutation. So we pulled out our notes and asked, what mutation did you find? And it turned out that mammoths, just like beach mouse, had the mutation arginine to cysteine change at position 65. Now, based on our work in beach mice, this suggested that mammoths, like beach mice, may have also been polymorphic in color. There may have been more blonde um, as well as uh, brown mammoths. Now, when we, we co-published these papers together, and of course, um, the mammoth story got a lot of attention, but one of the missing links in this story was, of course, why do mammoths, why would they be different in color? Um, and some of the headlines read things like, uh, blonde mammoths have more fun. So there was a, a guess that maybe it was important in sexual selection for attracting mates, but I think that was mostly in jest. So here we have two highly divergent mammals that have the same mutation um, in the same gene. But I wanna end by telling you just a few examples of cases in which there are different mutations in melanocortin-1 recept receptor that give um, rise to differences in color. So same gene, but different mutations. So the first example comes from uh, our beloved uh, cows. Um, we know that these beautiful, I think these are Holstein cows, I may be wrong about that, uh, but this beautiful auburn color that we see in cows is caused by a mutation in the melanocortin-1 receptor, a slightly different mutation we see, uh, that we see in mammoths or mice. Some of you um, may be dog lovers or have gotten a, what are referred to as COVID puppies. Um, one of the most famous breeds, of course, is uh, Labrador. And uh, Labradors often come in these two major forms, black labs and golden labs. The difference between these two is a mutation in the melanocortin-1 receptor. So of course, in these two cases, um, the color differences are driven not by natural selection, but instead by artificial selection as breeders have chosen um, which individuals to breed in, in uh, subsequent generation. So let's return to another example of natural selection that's really parallel to the story I told you about beach mice, and that are lizards living on the white sand dunes in White Sands, New Mexico. So you can look at this image and immediately you can um, guess which of these two lizards of the same species uh, lives on white, the, the white sand dunes and which lives in the um, dark neighboring desert soil. Again, in this case, there's a mutation in the melanocortin-1 receptor that leads to the light coloration in these lizards which like the beach mice um, have an, an advantage to uh, hiding from visually hunting predators. But of course, we're also interested in our own species and it turns out mutations in the melanocortin-1 receptor also contribute to human hair and skin, skin color. <coughs> Excuse me. So the um, beautiful auburn hair and creamy skin that we see in what most people will refer to as a redhead, like the actress Juliana Moore, have been attributed to mutations in the melanocortin-1 receptor. These are at high frequency, perhaps not surprisingly, in Irish populations, but of course can now be found throughout the world. The final example was another one of these surprises that came out of the world of ancient DNA because after folks sequenced the genome of mammoths, of course, um, the favorite subject of study has become Neanderthals. 
And when uh, the Neanderthal genome came out, uh, several folks were, of course, interested in looking at the melanocortin-1 receptor. And while we tend to think of Neanderthals are often depicted with dark skin and dark hair, it turns out there's a variant in the melanocortin-1 receptor that has the same effect on the receptor that we see in human populations, thus suggesting that at least some Neanderthals probably were redheaded too. And the estimate is about um, 5% of Neanderthals. So in this case, we have this gene that seems to be what one would refer to as a hotspot of evolutionary change, contributing to color differences um, through a number of different types of mutation in this receptor and giving rise to this diversity of um, color variation, not just in mammals, but in birds and in lizards um, as well. So what I hope to convince you of today that by understanding, um, using color as sort of a model trait, we can start to understand both how and why traits um, vary in natural environments and thereby have a better understanding of adaptation in the wild. And I love this example in part because I think Darwin would have been really tickled to know that his theory um, really uh, stood the test of time. And in particular, that missing piece of heritability has been solved because that's something that really bothered him when he published his study. And it's arguably one of the few things Darwin got wrong was trying to put forth an idea about heritability at a time where we just didn't have enough information to do so. So I hope to think that if you learned about uh, work like this, that he would consider uh, color adaptation and the underlying genetics to be an example of what he referred to as that perfection of structure and co-adaptation, which most justly excites our admiration. So with that, um, I'd like to um, invite you to ask questions. And I wanted to end on this slide. Um, for those of you who were trying to guess the um, uh, what colors and patterns uh, uh, I showed on the opening slide. Here are the answers um, to that question. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>